Welcome again to the Virtual Fraser Museum. My name is Tony, and I'm with you again in the Temple Cemetery. I'm sitting next to a grave which is not nearly as ostentatious as the one I showed you earlier, the Bernheim grave. This belongs to Louis Dimbitz. Perhaps you haven't heard that name. I hadn't, but I did a little bit of research. And what I think is interesting, at least to me, is that my research led me one way, and I thought I was going to tell you about one particular thing. And then I did dug a little more and realized it wasn't quite as simple as I thought. Louis Dimbitz was the uncle of Louis D. Brandeis, Louis David Brandeis initially. Louis Brandeis changed his middle name to Dimbitz in honor of his uncle, Louis Dimbitz, this man right here, who was a lawyer. Um, he was supposedly like a walking encyclopedia. He knew just about everything. He could speak eight or nine languages and also known as one of the most absent-minded men around. Lived here in Louisville. He was very fond of swimming. I have a story about that in a minute. Um, but but the, the, what I was going to tell you, what I thought I was going to tell you about this man is that he claimed to have been, and in the Louisville Encyclopedia is noted as being the author of the very first Australian ballot legislation in America. Now, the Australian ballot, same thing as a secret ballot. That means uh, you turn your votes in without speaking it out, and it's, you, um, you can do it anonymously, right, as we vote today, right? So the very first city in the country that had a law was Louisville, and he claims to have written it, and he, maybe he did. But in doing a little bit more research, thank you to Scott Campbell, I read his blog at the Harlan and Brandeis, or Brandeis and Harlan um, papers at the Louisville Law School Library. That's a lot of words. Um, but his research in reading it, it, I found that the man for whom the, the law was named, Arthur Wallace, who was a legislator here in Louisville, claims that not Dembitz, but rather Wallace had the idea. Now, it's hard to say one way or the other. Wallace had a few people who corroborated it. But we could leave it at that and say it could be one, could be the other, and maybe it is. But I do also want to note that that law, this secret vote, which was important and has been important in all of our voting ever since, um, and why I think it's timely today when we're thinking about mail-in ballots and whatnot, that vote, or that type of voting, secret ballot, was shortly thereafter, um, they found ways to, to game the system, to, to be corrupt in the voting. And people would buy votes, and, and one, two of the most famous in Louisville are actually buried in the St. Louis Cemetery, where in fact you've seen our own Nick Sullivan, and I believe Heather. Um, John and James Wallet. they were proprietors of um, a theater, kind of a burlesque theater, kind of an adult theater, and um, also purveyors of whiskey in this town shortly before Prohibition. And it was getting tough for them to do business, particularly in the burlesque adult theater um, venue. So uh, they found a way to change or to um, work the voting system by buying votes and intimidating people. And it got so bad that in 1905, the election was literally thrown out because they had messed it up so much. It was so corrupt, they said, thanks to those Wallen boards, the Wallen men. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because the person, one of the people who was brought in, who was helping them, who was, had stacks of um, money to buy votes, was in fact that same Arthur Wallace, who claimed that Dimbits did not actually write or was not as integral into that process as he was. So I say this only to remind us that um, there's more than one side of the story in history, and uh, we're not certain, in fact, who did it. But most, if you look at the Louisville Encyclopedia, it will say Louis Dimbitz. Interesting to note. Other thing I wanted to say about Dimbitz is a little, just a brief little story about him, and I think it's fascinating, or fun at least. He was very fond of swimming. I mentioned that earlier. And apparently one night, 1853, he went swimming with two friends in the Ohio River. 
and they swam all the way across to the Indiana side and were going to swim their way back. And he struck out in front of everyone else and was swimming lustily and strongly and apparently was carried away by the current. And it was dark. I think it was in the evening. Carried down the falls of the Ohio. As the story goes, according to the Courier Journal, he caught on to a rock and held there for a little while, but then fell off and was sucked down into the river. Um, now, unknown to his friends, who were able to wave a passing skiff and they were taken to the Louisville Wharf, unknown to them, he had actually washed ashore in New Albany. Of course, they had been swimming naked, so he jumped out entirely naked, walked most of the way up to Jeffersonville, borrowed some pants and a shirt and a cap, took a ferry across, and there were his friends, perhaps his family as well, who were kind of moaning that they'd lost Louis Dimbitz. And he arrived, there he was, in entirely different clothes. Um, but I thought that's a funny story to pick up. I, I never would have known it. This guy right here. Yep. Sometimes he would forget that he had a hat on or he didn't have a hat on. He would misplace his coat often. This is what they mean when they say absent-minded. But apparently he was an excellent swimmer, rode the, little, the Ohio River almost daily, um, and a, a devoutly religious man. Again, history is fascinating. It's all around you. You do a little research and you find some fascinating stories. Thank you. I really hope to see you again in person, but thank you for joining me virtually here at the Patreon.